Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shimon Tiger, also called Legolas, or just Lego for short. And we are going to look at the problems that cause the most trouble. Uh, we are going to start with the easier ones, and as we move on, the problems would get harder. Um, uh, I, I apologize for my grammar. It's, it's not as good as it should be, but I hope it won't be so, such a problem. Anyway, definitely, definitely the easiest problem that caused serious troubles to many of you is the problem M3. Also, uh, the uh, restless washing machine. Uh, so the problem is that we've got a washing machine and it is rotating with a frequency F and there is some laundry inside, but it, the laundry is not perfectly balanced as all things should be, but the center of mass of uh, the laundry is in this is rotating in distance r from the axis of the washing machine. And the question is, um, what is the minimal mass of the washing machine required? It uh, required so the washing machine won't bounce. Um, well, uh, the, the problem is stating we can assume that uh, washing machine doesn't move in any other direction than just up and down. So, uh, so otherwise the problem would be really hard. So, so we can just focus on this vertical direction. Um, well, in order to laundry to move in in the circle, there must be some centripetal force acting on it and causing it to do so. So uh, the value of this uh, force can be calculated as mass of, of an object, angular freq frequency squared times the distance between the center of mass and the axis, exactly that, that R that is here. Mass is just the mass of our laundry, that's in the problem. And angular frequency, that's just shortcut for uh, two times pi times the actual frequency. So the the value of the centripetal force required to laundry to move in, in the circle is m times four times pi squared f squared r. All right, and when the washing machine starts to jump, well, uh, when the laundry is at the bottom, um, the washing machine has to push it up. So that's okay, the washing machine can just push the laundry up. But when the laundry is at the top, the washing machine has to push the laundry to the bottom to, in order to, to, under, to maintain that uh, circular tra trajectory. Uh, and the maximal force uh, the washing machine can push down is equal to its weight. So, so the gravitational force pulling the washing machine down. So M mass of the washing machine times G. And, and this is exactly the mistake most of you made uh, because the washing machine is not the only thing acting on the laundry. There is also a gravitational force pulling the laundry downwards. So if 
we say that the centripetal force is just so this FC. Um, and then there is some gravitational force pulling the laundry downwards equal to weight of the laundry, of course. Um, for the washing machine has to put just the rest of, yeah, has to push just with the, the, just the difference of these forces. So actually the centripetal force is equal to the force uh, washing machine pushing the laundry down plus the actual weight of the laundry. And this is now correct. And we just evaluate the mass. Oh, this is, this is the maximal force the washing machine can push the laundry down. And so we can just evaluate the minimal uh, mass required of the washing machine required to uh, to just stay <laughs> on the ground and not bounce is we do it, it is m times uh, uh -huh. just some algebra here Am I right? It seems I'm right. So this is the answer. <laughs> the minimal required mass of the version machine so it won't jump, whatever. Do we have any questions? Or? Okay. Um, just to remind you, there is a slide where you can Put your questions if you have any. But for now, we will move on to the problem uh, from the series about thermodynamics. Actually, the first one, uh, T1, also called drinking water. The problem is that Danka has a bottle, a glass bottle, uh, and yeah, besides, I I'm not so very good at English grammar. I'm really, really bad in drawing pictures. So let's imagine this is a glass bottle, okay? Uh, and it has total volume, volume of bottle. And at the beginning, there was some volume of water. It's denoted V1, I suppose. Yep. And the pressure of the air inside of the bottle is just equal to atmospheric pressure at the beginning. Then Danka drank some of the water and uh, volume of the drank water is denoted V zero or O. And the question is how much the pressure inside, uh, the pressure of the air inside the bottle decreased. If we assume Danka did not breathe in or out any other air. And, and also we assume that uh, Danka drank that water quite quickly. So no, uh, no heat exchange uh, happened. Why is it important to consider this? Well, uh, if Danka would drink the water slowly, so the heat exchange could have, could have happened, uh, the temperature of that air would stay the same. Uh, so the, that would be isothermic process. But as the uh, problem is saying, this is not what happened, uh, the, the process that happened was uh, adiabatic. That's 
that's the process defined that by that uh, we have no heat exchange during the process. So that's probably the mistake most of you, no, many of you made. That you did not consider the right thermodynamic process process that the air inside the battle undergo is adiabatic. Okay, and for, for this process, you can Google quite easily or der derive not so easily uh, that uh, pressure of the gas times its volume raised to the power of kappa. Uh, many people denote the kappa also uh, gamma. Um, is constant during during the whole process, uh, where uh, kappa is also known as Poisson's constant or uh, the capacity ratio, and it was not directly stated in the pro problem what the value of kappa is, but in the problem was stated that we can assume that air has uh, F five degrees of freedom. And you can again <laughs> probably Google that uh, this person con person's constant is equal to degrees of freedom plus two over the number of degrees of freedom. In our case, that's seven over five, that's 1.4, I suppose. So we know that this number, the pressure times the volume raised to the this number should stay constant during the whole process. And we, we can calculate uh, this number at the beginning because we know that at the beginning there was atmospheric pressure inside the bottle and the volume of the air inside the bottle was just the volume of the bottle minus the volume of the water that was inside the bottle so this raise to the power of kappa and uh, after Danka drank this water, there would be some different pressure. Exactly the pressure we want to know. <laughs> uh, and also the volume would be different. Well, it would still be the volume of the bottle minus the volume of the water that was inside the bottle at the beginning, but uh, plus the volume of the water that Danka drank. As Danka drank this water, the volume in volume of air has to decrease, uh, has to increase by that amount. And that raise to the power of kappa. All right. So we just we just Count the, this value of the pressure after then drank this water as uh, all raised the power of kappa. Okay, but the question is not what the new uh, pressure would be, but what would be the difference between the pressure at the beginning and the pressure at the end. So we just want to know not the difference, but the decrease. So atmospheric minus the new one. So that's 
atmospheric times one minus that fraction raised volume of the bottom minus one plus volume of drunk water raised to the power of kappa end of the bracket. So this is the answer. Um, now, what others, other mistakes could you have done? Uh, the, the way the volumes were stated in the problem was a bit confusing. So it's important not to get lost in the conversion of the units. And also the difference was really, really high. So maybe you got confused by that, but uh, always when, well, it was, it was re really high, but always when the number, if, if your result is kind of unrealistic, you, it, it doesn't necessarily mean your result is wrong. It's, it also can be that uh, the values in the problems were just nonsense. And that's, that was this case, the, if I'm right, the, uh, the volume of the water, uh, of the air would have, would have be three times the volume at the beginning that, and that's something uh, human just can do. So that's the reason the pressure was so high. <laughs> Okay, uh, now let's move on to the reason uh, announcement of the results was uh, delayed. <laughs> we just wanted to make us really sure that we've got this problem right. The problem T5, uh, breakfast in Dukovani. Dukovani is the power plant. Uh, in the Czech Republic. So the problem is that we've got ourselves some volume of water. We want to make us a tea. Uh, and so we have to heat up that water from its uh, current temperature to the 100 degrees of Celsius, we know that like this. Yeah, the first um, mistake you could have done is that well, we just want to make a tea. We don't want to vaporize all the water. So we just have to heat up from the 15 degrees of the Celsius it has at the beginning to 100 at the end. We don't want to vaporize it all. Uh, and we want to do that in three minutes. I don't know the three minutes by T max. And as we are in a power plant, we would use uh, some uh, radioactive plutonium. It was plutonium 238, no, some, some radioactive plutonium. <laughs> and um, Let's assume we, we can use 80% of the energy uh, from its decay, from the decay of that plutonium. And also uh, there was stated the, the ener uh, energy from decay of one particle uh, one atom of that plutonium, and it's uh, half-life. What is the half-life of radioactive material? Well, it's constant, <laughs> defined by it's well, it's time it takes uh, to. Uh, to half in <laughs> half its number. So if we've got N zero of atoms 
of this plutonium. So uh, after time, after some time, uh, we've got the number of plutonium we still have after the time t passes is that a number we had at the beginning times Euler's constant raised to the power of minus logarithm two times that time we let it to decay over its half-life. That's still in the exponent. So if uh, we wait time uh, equal to the half-life, this would be one. So, and e raised to the power of minus logarithm two is one half. So we would have just half of the particles we begin with. Uh, and in the case of this plutonium we had, the half-life is something like uh, 87.7 years. Uh, okay. And the, uh, another important thing when we are dealing with radioactivity is the activity of our radioactive material. And it is defined as the derivation of the number of a particles. Um, so if you don't know how to derivate, I will just do that for you. Activity in the given time T would be the number of the particles at the beginning times, oh, it's minus that derivation, of course, uh, times logarithm two of two over the half-life times e raised to the power of minus logarithm two over t over half-life times time. And so this activity is telling us how, how many particles do decay in one second. This is what the activity is telling us. Uh, so if we just, yeah, now it's important to notice one thing. Uh, at the beginning, the time should be, would be zero, right? So the activity at the beginning is equal just, oh, if the, the, this time is zero, e raised to the power of zero is one. So this is our initial, initial activity. Anyway, uh, this logarithm two uh, over uh, the half-life is um, usually denoted as lambda, but whatever. Okay, uh, and after the three minutes, we were heating up our T, the activity would decrease because, well, now we have less of our radioactive material, but let's just calculate how exactly it, it decreased. So uh, activity at the end, so final, would be, again, the number of particles at the beginning times this fraction times E raised to the power of uh, Okay, now this is the time we were warming up our T. So that's three minutes. This is the half-life of our plutonium, 87 years, almost 88 years. Uh, 
So this number is incredibly small. Now, e raised to the power of zero is exactly one, but e raised to the power of incredibly small number is number incredibly close to one. So this is like almost equal to the initial activity. Oh, this is another problem. <laughs> so we can say the activity during that three minutes we are doing our tea actually doesn't change at all because well, you can calculate it really precisely, you will see the difference is nowhere close to affect uh, the, the result we actually need. Uh, so if the activity doesn't change during uh, the whole process uh, and, and the activity is telling us the number of uh, atoms that decay per second, and we mm, have uh, the 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 um, heat we got from one decay. We can just count the 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 energy of the energy we got from the decaying of the, those particles by, by just multiplying these numbers. So the heat we got is the activity. So the number of particles decayed per second times time. We are and times the heat from the one decay, yeah, this is an absolute number of decays. This is energy from one decay. And we also have to multiply it by the ratio of how, how, many, how much energy we, do we actually use, uh, we can use from this. So this is the energy we got, the heat we got from the decay. And so we just said it's equal to the energy we need, uh, the heat we need. Uh, so that's the, uh, I think, well, whatever. Uh, we get the volume of, the, of our rotor times uh, it's, um times it, mm, kilograms over th th 1000 kilograms over meter cu cubic meter uh times the, the temperature difference we want to heat that water up by so uh final temperature minus the temperature at the beginning uh that times uh, mass heat capacity of water. That's like 4,200 uh, joules per kilogram per uh, degree of Celsius. And well, that's almost everything. Uh, now we just uh, put that the activity is the number of particles at the beginning times the logarithm of two over the time. And we can calculate the number of particles we need to, uh, to do ourselves a P. Uh, that would be quite the large fraction. Uh, 
Apple. Times energy from the one. Okay. And the times logarithm of two, and this times the half life. Is it seen on camera? So this is the number of the particles we need. It's quite a large number, but uh, the problem is asking not for the number of the put on number of the um, atoms of plutonium we need. The problem is asking uh, for the mass of them. So we just have to use to Google more more mass of this. Mm, plutonium and just multiply it by, by that and divide it by Avogadro's constant. And well, now it's important not to get lost in the conversion of the units. For example, don't forget this is in years, this is in minutes, we have to somehow uh, convert it to the same time, maybe seconds, but it can be any uh, any unit, any time unit. And yeah, I'm not going to go through all this conversion, but um, I would just recommend using um, Excel or some other spreadsheet to do conversions, uh, to, do, to do such a, uh, such a such number of calculations just by calculator is really hard <laughs> and I would say not really wise thing to do. Uh, but I would like to address uh, the units of the heat from the one decay. Uh, in problem there were uh, that the, the were stated uh, this number in the units of mega electron volts. Well, the electron volt is the unit of energy and it's the energy uh, that one electron got when we, uh, when we speed it up by uh, potential of one volt. So you have to, you either have to Google <laughs> the conversion between electron volts and joules directly, or uh, you have to Google uh, the charge of one electron and just multiply it by one volt. And that's, uh, that's the energy of one electron volt in joules. Uh, do we have any questions or? It seems yes. So the question is uh, in problem T5, I believe I also had to consider the actual uh, boiling of the water that is uh, also include the latent heat of vaporization in the calculation yeah. of the heat. Why isn't it included in the official solution and only the heat needed to heat the water to 100 degrees Celsius taken? Well. As I said, uh, we want to just make a tea, not to vaporize all the water we are, <laughs> we have. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about this. Probably many people had confu got, got confused by this, but maybe we could have done the uh, the problem more clear, but this is this is how cooking. I don't know if you ever made a tea, but <laughs> you don't want to vaporize all the water if you are doing a tea. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the problem uh, X three. 
also called uh, poisoned. Uh, in this problem, we got a pond of water. of the total value we, I suppose, and it got somehow poisoned. Uh, so let's denote the concentration of the poison C. And there is a stream coming into the pond and also stream, stream of fresh water coming into the pond with flow rate of Q and also the stream coming out of it with the, and the problem is saying that the total volume of water in the pond uh, don't, doesn't change. So the stream coming out of the pond has to have the same flow rate as the stream coming into it. And we are asking uh, how much time does it take to concentration of the poison to decrease to one tenth of its initial value. So in the, in the time zero, mm, the concentration is um, C zero. And we want to know the time when the concentration would be C0 over 10. Okay. So what does the concentration actually mean? Uh, it's just a ratio of the volume uh, of the poison over the overall volume of the pond. So that's kind of the definition. And also uh, the problem says that um, the poison is well mixed. That means that actually if we take any, uh, we don't have to take all the pond, if we take any uh, volume, uh, some, uh, we, we uh, the volume of the poison inside uh, this volume would be C, the volume of the poison inside this volume would be just the concentration of poison times this volume we took. So the fresh water is coming to the pond and the water coming out of the pond uh, has to have some poison inside it, right? Because it is, as I said, if we take any <laughs> volume of the water from the pond, well, that's exactly what this for um, this stream is doing it is taking some volume from the pond the um, the volume of the poison inside that could be calculated by this so uh, and what just uh, what does the uh, flow rate actually mean the flow rate is uh, means that if we multiply the flow rate with some with some short uh, oh with some short period of time uh, that's uh, the uh, the volume of water that flowed from the pond by, by the stream that that's what does uh, what does the flow rate mean? It's it's the units are uh, liters per second, or just volumes per second. So if we multiply it by time, we get volume. 
And uh, the overall volume of the font doesn't change, but the volume of poison inside it does change. So the question is, how exactly does it change? Well, as I said, in any volume of water, uh, the volume of poison inside is concentration times this volume. So if we multiply both of these sides by uh, concentration, here we get the how much uh, this I get confused in my own notation. Well, let's just forget about this. So the concentration times the volume of water coming out of the pond is equal to the decrease of volume of the poison inside the pond. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and now the concentration is this ratio over here. So we can write that the volume of the poison inside the pond over the volume of whole pond times the flow rate of the stream times some short uh, period of time is equal to minus tiny decrease of volume of the poison inside the pond. So this is differential equation, but don't get too afraid of it. It, it is not so difficult to solve this. Uh, I will show you the method. For, I, I think the easiest method of solving differential, differential equations that ever. And it's called separation of variables. So at first we have to separate our variables. Um, here we got the tiny uh, difference in the volume uh, of the poison. And we just move the volume of the poison to, to, separate, to separate the variables. We just move this, this thing here. So here we got minus. Also, if there would be any time dependent variable, we would have to move that. Oh, time, time. And, oh, and if there would be any time in this differential equation, we would have to move that on the side where is the T, but we do not have uh, it anywhere. So let's just write the rest. And now, if these sides are equal, well, I think integrals of them should be also equal. Um, some mathematician would maybe disagree, but honestly, I don't care. Uh, we are physicists over here. So the integrals are really simple. This doesn't depend on time. So, uh, Actually, those two integrals you can really find in any table of integrals there is. <laughs> so this is just, we just multiplied that by time. And this is minus, I, I just, yeah, uh, actually I would, we, I, I somehow that I don't, we don't want to really know what is the volume we, we do want 
to take care about the concentration. So I just uh, put <laughs> this, use this two times in this fraction and we will find out that this is also decrease of concentration over concentration. Uh, and the integral of this is minus logarithm of C. This is not the plus C you should always write after you evaluate uh, indefinite integral. But as we got also, we got already C, I would write the integrational constant as A. And this, we can, this, the difference of the integrational constant from one side and the other. There's no need to use two differential, uh, two integrational constants. If we can also, we can just write the difference. We do not know what this A is so far. Uh, now we want to know the concentration. So we just make raise uh, e to the power, if those sides are equal, e to the power of those sides should be also equal. So on the one side, we've got e to the power of q uh, over volume times t, and that's equal to minus concentration uh, times e to the power of a uh, now uh, the concentration uh, no, 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 no. So many mistakes. So many mistakes. This is one over concentration. E to the power of minus logarithm of concentration is one over the concentration. So if we want now our concentration, that's C is equal to e to the minus q full rate over the volume of the pond times time times e to the a. Anyway, we know at the beginning, so when the time is equal to zero, the concentration was equal to some c zero for the time equal to zero this is e to the power of zero so this is one so the concentration is equal to e to the power of a so e to the power of a has to be equal to c zero uh, we'll just write it over here so c is equal to c zero times e to the minus flow rate over volume times the time. That's the concentration in the time t. Anyway, if you all go over there, there is really similarity between the radioactive decay and the decreasing <laughs> of the concentration of the poison inside the pond. That's not just a coincidence. These two processes are really similar and you can find this, this called the exponential decrease. You can find it many, many, many times. Uh, all right, and actually back to the question, which I somehow hit probably. No, uh, the question was, in what time the concentration would be uh, C0 over 10. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so we just set this equal to C0 over 10. These two cancels out. And then we take a logarithm of both sides. So here we've got a logarithm of one over 10. And here we got logarithm of e to the minus something is that minus something. So that time we need would be well logarithm of the fraction is also minus logarithm of the opposite fraction minus is cancels. Oh this there should be minus here. Uh, and the time we we were searching for is Logarithm ten times the value over the four. For it, uh, this result does make a sense because well, the higher the flow rate would be, the the more fast would be the decrease of the concentration, and the larger the pond would be, the slower would the decrease be. Oh, okay. Do we have any questions? No. Is anyone watching me? Or I... <laughs> or you don't know? Okay. Uh, what is the next problem I wanted to take a look at? All right. Um, the last problem from the series about mechanics. You probably think that's some hard problem and well, it of course is a hard problem, but it's not, a, not as hard as it may seem on the, on the first side. So the problem is this, uh, we've got some track, uh, the number of it is um, 17, I think. Uh, the point is we've got some track for the cars and its shape is something like this. So from the top, it looks like, like this, but, and from, from the side, it is, um, oh, I said, I don't know, draw very well. Something like this. And uh, the cars we let going down this track don't have any steering, so they just, um, they just slide on the edge of, of the track. Uh, and we know that this, uh, this radius is R and the height difference between this is H. And yeah, the point is, Yarda uh, let one car down this track and from the one point with zero initial velocity. And then another car after some time difference, that was five seconds, I suppose. And the question is, what would be the maximal distance between these two cars, uh, like the 
maximum number of turns, uh, the first car would be ahead from the second car. At first, um, first moment I saw this, I was frightened as well, but I, it really turns out this is not as hard as it seems now, believe me. Okay. Uh, the first thing we would like to know is, of course, this angle. The, the angle of, of the track, actually. Uh, well, if we would take that uh, the track and just do something like this, 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 we would get triangle, which this side would be just equal to H and this side would be equal to circumference of uh, of this uh, circle. So just two times pi times R and uh, this angle is right angle. So this side we can calculate as two times pi times r squared plus h squared and square root of that. And this is angle alpha. And, but we do not actually need alpha. We need sine alpha and cosine alpha. And sine and cosine are just Sine is just ratio of this side over this side. So sine alpha would be equal to h over oh, this square root over here. I will just do some shortcuts. And cosine alpha would be 2 times pi times r over this square root. And uh, so from now on, I will write just sine and cosine alpha, and I would mean these two fractions. Okay, now uh, we can easily calculate um, the acceler acceleration of the car if there would be no friction. The acceleration would be, oh, you got our car, just, and there is gravitational force pulling down, but the track is preventing the car from doing directly down, so we have to take a projection of this force to this direction and as this angle is alpha, this angle is also alpha. So the force that would cause the car to accelerate would be m times g times sine alpha. Oh, this read really okay. So if there would be no friction and we would for, uh, forget that, no, oh, no. If there would be no friction, the acceleration of the car, like the, the change of uh, value of the speed, I'm not talking uh, acceleration as the changing the direction only uh, acceleration as changing the value of speed now uh, would be uh, G times sine alpha. At least I hope. All right, but there is a friction. And the friction is between 
the edge of the track and the car. And the value of friction, we can evaluate as the friction coefficient. In this case, it was stated as mu something, something like 0 0.4 times the force, uh, the two things are pushing on each other. So in this case, the force, the car is pushing on the wall edge of the track. Uh, so we would use that uh, center pedal force again, as in the problem M3, uh, because, well, that's the force the, the wall has to push on the car to, for, for, in order to car, car to not go away from the track, just going in the circles down. Uh, so, but we do not have the angular frequency now. We just have some velocities, but that's, that, that's not the problem because uh, we know that the angular frequency uh, is also equal to the velocity of the thing over its over the ra radius of the circle it is going around. So if you just put that inside here, we get m times the velocity squared over the radius r. Uh, now it is important not to get lost in the not notation because I will just draw the same triangle once again. Let this be our car. If the velocity of the car would, mm, we, if we denote the velocity of the car. Uh, we then we can take a projection of it to the horizontal uh, no, the vertical direction and the horizontal direction, which would be the values would be just using that sign and cosine, there would be V times sine alpha and V times cosine alpha. All right, and that vertical, uh, vertical projection of the velocity that isn't, it's not circ circulating around, it's just going down. The uh, the projection that is circling around is that horizontal projection that it's going like, as, it's, as the car is going around, it's changing around. It's changing a direction in the circle. So actually this is not correct. This is correct because the edge has to only mm, cause this projection to changes direction. But then, okay, so the, we, we then got our, ourselves our, our friction. Uh, well, if we, oh, then the friction would be that mu, times m times v squared over r times cosine squared of alpha. Uh, so the actual uh, acceleration of the car would be this minus the friction 
over the mass of the car. So times mu velocity squared over R times cosine squared alpha. Uh, and well, this is once again, differential equation, but we will not solve this one. Actually, one of the biggest mistake, mistakes you could have made in this problem was to try to solve this differential equation. It is not unsolvable, but there's actually no need to solve it. Why? Well, let's just take a closer look at this. Uh, at the beginning, the car has zero velocity, so the friction is zero. So uh, the, the acceleration would be positive, so the car would accelerate. Uh, therefore, the velocity would become non-zero, it would be higher and higher, so then the acceleration would be lower and lower. As the acceleration would be lower and lower, uh, the velocity would still increase, but slower and slower. Uh, and well, we can actually calculate uh, the maximum velocity uh, car could have as uh, as the velocity in, for which the acceleration would be zero. Well, we just set this right side equal to zero and to get that the the velocity for which the acceleration would be zero. It, that's uh, commonly called the terminal velocity. So v sub t would be equal to uh, g sine of alpha r over mu cosine squared of alpha square root of that. That should be right. And yeah, the car can't get velocity higher than this because if the car would reach this velocity, its acceleration would be zero and it won't accelerate anymore. It would just stay on this, uh, on this velocity. But actually it won't really reach this velocity. It would just get closer and closer to it. We would try to plot some graph of it. There's here on this axis, there would be time, on this velocity. Let's say here would be velocity, the term of velocity. At the beginning, the car has zero velocity and it would just rise and it, won't, it should never actually reach that. <laughs> Something like this. There's not to scale, not to anything. I did not really put, solve the equation of the graph, but so it, the graph it will look something like this. Mm. You saw me to draw a battle, so just. <laughs> okay, and now, uh, now it's important to note that uh, the acceleration would be always positive. Well, in order to acceleration to be negative, the velocity of the car uh, would need to be higher than the terminal velocity. In that case, the acceleration would be negative. But as I just said, the car can't get uh, velocity higher than the terminal one. So the acceleration 
would be always positive. The, uh, the car would only be getting faster and faster. And why is this important? Well, let's get back to the actual question. <laughs> there are two cars, the identical cars from released from the same spot uh, with same zero initial velocity. Just the second one has been released five seconds later. So their equations for the second car would be just the same as for the first car. So the graph, its graph of uh, the velocity would be the same just with that five second delay. So we will just put that in the same plot. It would be something like this. Well, this is that that time difference between releasing the first car and the second car. Uh, now, as I said, the second car is just delayed. So uh, if we would, well, from, we can see it actually from the graph that the velocity of the second car would be always lower for each given time. The velocity of the second car would be lower than the velocity of the first car. That's just because uh, it's, it's five seconds behind it. And so it didn't. And yeah, that, that's just because the acceleration is positive. So the, the first car during that five seconds, the first car is ahead, it uh, get higher velocity. Uh, so as the first car is always the faster one, uh, the distance between the first and second car would only increase because well, the first car is going faster. Uh, but also we may see from this plot that the difference between their velocities would go to the zero, right? The velocities would be closer and closer to the terminal one and also closer and closer to each other. Um, so hypothetically, at the in, for the infinite time, uh, the both cars would reach terminal velocity. Just the first car would be still the one that is five seconds ahead. So the the difference uh, between between them, like I'm the, the distance between them, and I'm not counting the shortest distance. I'm counting like you know, this distance would be just easily their velocity times uh, that the time the second car is delayed. Uh, do we have any questions about this problem already or? Okay, I'm either too clear or too confusing. But uh, the problem is not asking about this distance between the cars. The problem is asking uh, about the number of turns uh, the first car is ahead of the second one. So once again, <laughs> the same triangle we just have to make projection of uh, that distance to the uh, vertical direction. So 
the, the difference in uh, the, in the height of of the cars would be um, the terminal velocity times the time times sine alpha. And if we want to calculate the number of turns, we have to just divide this difference by um, the difference of the of height difference uh, equivalent to one turn. So that's just H. Uh, th so then we get the number of turns that's between those two cars at, at the hypothetically at the in the infinite time uh, as uh, them. G times R times sine to the power of three of alpha times T that over mu times H times cosine squared of alpha. And now we would have to plug in uh, those uh, sine and cosine of alpha. But, oh, that would be just algebra. And I think we, we reached the time we should stop. I know we've got a question, okay. In your graph of the function t plus five, as it's in the problem, would translate to the left. T minus five translates to the right. I wanted to ask you if you are showing the second car in the first graph depiction. Uh, sorry, can I just see that question? <laughs> I still don't understand. Like, I would try to tell something about the graph of the graphs of uh, the velocities would be the same, just shifted by these five seconds. So, if this is the velocity of the first car, this is the velocity of the second car in just in the time so and we can like set this zero also to if we would say that this is the zero time we could also put the axis here and look that as the second from the uh from the second car's point of view uh just the first car was ahead by something and um, still going faster. Maybe we would take a look at the question uh, with some someone who is better in English. <laughs> or can you, or do you understand the question? Could, could you translate it to me? <laughs> and ask that, and answer that later, I don't know. And well, if that's if there is no other question right now, well, you could you can always send us emails. Our our emails are in the solution book and on the web page, uh, and so on. So we will try to answer them all. 
and so I would just like to thank you for your attention and hopefully you learned something and <laughs> goodbye.